وما أرسلنا من قبلك إلا رجالا نوحي إليهم فاسألوا أهل الذكر إن كنتم لا تعلمون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, So this is a continuation a part two of our lecture that I gave I began last week about the reality of the hijab and last week I had mentioned the fact that the hijab has become a symbol between a very uh, brutal battle of two different camps. It is no longer about uh, the woman's head covering. It is about identity. It is about, uh, frankly, one civilization, the Western civilization, trying to superimpose its understanding upon uh, our uh, uh, sharia and our understanding. And this is happening around the globe, uh, whether it's in France, whether, it's in, uh, uh, whether it is in uh, India. Uh, and of course, I forgot to mention, I got a lot of mixed messages, Quebec and right up north, right uh, from, uh, from us up north in Canada. So it's happening all over the world. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that from a sociological perspective. That was uh, last week. Uh, this week, we're going to move on and talk about the issue of the covering more from a textual, i.e. from the Quran and from the Sunnah perspective. And before I begin, again, I have to take a step back because uh, the topic has become so charged and so sensitive that it is important that we give these disclaimers. The, the, the sensitivity arises from the fact that some people say that men are always obsessed with what women wear and don't wear. And they're telling women what they should do and what they should not do. And there's a level of, of irritation that comes uh, from this. It's an understandable nuisance. So in this lecture, I want to ask you to ignore the speaker and ignore the speaker's gender and ignore everything about the speaker and listen to the speech. Because this is not from me. I will be quoting you the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll be quoting you the Quran and I'll be explaining the Quran. And I ask you, if you disagree with my explanation, then you have every right to go challenge it, but do it from within academic parameters. If you disagree with what the Quran is saying, then, and you say my interpretation is incorrect, that's fine, then show me where, and ignore my gender. So when I'm speaking today, please ignore who I am, and listen to the content of the speech. Because what is really interesting when it comes to the issue of men's and women's awrah, because both men and women have a certain um, awrah and a certain uh, protocol, that when it comes to this awrah, the Quran is actually very explicit. And the fact of the matter is that, you know, unlike most ahkam of the sharia, when you have to go to a hadith for details, generally speaking, when it comes to the issue of hijab, we don't even really need to go to the ahadith. The Quran itself is sufficient and it gives us the broad parameters. The hadith just fills in some missing details and whatnot. But before we begin with the hijab, and once again, I have to do this because I understand this topic is very sensitive. Before I jump to the hijab, I'm going to go to a society where there is no hijab. And I'm going to start from the alternative paradigm. So here we are saying that our sharia says men and women should cover up. And our sharia says men and women have this protocol. And our sharia says that men and women have to act this way. Okay, I'm going to get there in a while. Before I get there, what is the reality of a society that abandons these laws? What happens when there is no awrah? What happens when there is promiscuity? What happens when there's no regulation whatsoever? When it is a free for all? Well, we live in one such society where by and large the rise of social media and the rise of the internet and by the way today's talk will be somewhat explicit so yani, Nothing that explicit, but still, I'm going to be mentioning issues like pornography and whatnot. So if you feel uncomfortable as a parent, that is between you. But I'm not going to mention you know, uh, anything that explicit. But this is a reality that even a nine-year-old understands sometimes better than their parents do, unfortunately. But I will mention some effects of what happens when you remove these restrictions. Because the Arabs have a saying, by the opposites do you appreciate what you're talking about. 
Why the opposites do you appreciate what you're talking about? When you study the opposite, you appreciate the subject at hand. So here we are talking about the hijab and covering of women and covering of protocol. Okay, before we get there, what happens when you remove the hijab? And what happens when it's a free for all? And what happens when we have the rise of social media and explicit images everywhere? and promiscuity and pornography in almost every single household on earth because we are now seeing for the first time in human history the effects of promiscuity at a global level. The effects of explicit images, they're still being studied because this is the first generation. This is the first generation in human history where your average teenager in the broader society has been exposed to more nudity than all of his ancestors combined. Think about that. This is the first time this is happening. So we're studying the impact and the effects. And there is a general consensus in the psychiatric community amongst academic researchers that the adverse effects of sexually explicit images, that the harmful nature of pornography, we cannot fully still grasp it. But overall, there is almost a consensus that the harms far outweigh any perceived goods that might be there. And in fact, the harms are direct and tangible. You can measure those harms. You can actually measure those harms. Quite a few studies have been done about the effects of pornography on the family and on the breakdown of the family and even on the structure of the family. And again, I have to be just a little bit explicit here, but pornography destroys a man's manhood. A father cannot become a father. There has been a direct linkage between uh, pornography and between the fact that young men cannot actually become fathers. They're not capable of being fathers and producing children. There's a direct correlation between pornography and between ED. A study by the Society of Andrology and Sexual Medicine surveyed 28,000 men and they found that the addiction to porn led to a lower sexual drive in their actual lives. They cannot function as biological human beings because they're in an imaginary world. Think about that. They're in an imaginary world online, so their real lives and their real families become impacted. And we now see for the first time in human history, young men are not able to be intimate with their spouses because they're addicted to images and not actual women. They want images and they're not finding what they want in the actual real world. And this is linked to the decline in both marriage and in fertility. Marriage is at its lowest in all of Western history. Marriage, the institution of marriage, is at its lowest in, its, in Western history. And that is because when you have these explicit images and the easy hookup culture becomes prevalent, well then, the incentive for a young man to become a man, to, because realize, again, this is a very deep topic, but, you know, 100 years ago, for all of human history, a young man had strong motivation to get a career, get a job, get his act together, earn an income, live a decent and dignified life because he had to be a suitable partner. He had to find and propose to a lady. Who's going to marry him if he doesn't have a career or a job? He needs to start a family. He needs to satisfy his human desires. Well, what's going to happen when those desires can be satisfied without a biological woman? What's going to happen when there's all of these fake images, when promiscuity is everywhere? All of a sudden, and that desire to be a man, that desire to have a career. And that's why, and again, I mean, this is a blunt topic, but there is a reason why so many young men, even until their 20s and 30s, they're sitting at home on their couches playing PS4 and not having careers. Frankly, there's a reason for this, right? And it's not just pornography, but it is definitely one of the causes. Also, we have seen, and this is one of the, the worst um, uh, manifestations of this, of this disease of pornography, is that pornography is now viewed as an actual addiction. There is actually statistics and surveys to demonstrate that what happens to drug addicts, what happens to, to drug users, what happens to alcoholics, the same thing happens in the brain of those people that are addicted to all of this fahisha. And the amount of time that is wasted, the amount of money that is wasted, the dopamine effects of watching this type of filth, because there is a chemical release, the happy chemical is called dopamine. Dopamine is the same chemical that cocaine releases 
images, it is released with these fahisha images, right? The same chemical is released. So that dopamine effect that is now being released in men when they become addicted to this, it is literally like a drug. They crave it. They're addicted to it. And just like a drug, after a while you become immune, what do you have to do? Increase. Increase. So just like a drug, same thing goes for this filth, this genre of evil that you might start off with one genre, then it gets worse and worse and it gets violent and it gets even more filthy because that's what happens when you are addicted. And one study by Pew estimated that over $40 billion in America is lost of potential revenue because people waste their time while they should be in office, while they should be working. Instead of working, they're surfing the net for these filthy genres, right? $40 billion of income to just this one country, this is a, a guesstimate, is lost because people are not spending time doing their work and instead surfing the net for this type of filth. Now obviously there has also been a direct correlation between violence against women and pornography and between objectifying women and between date rape and pornography. Again, all of this is statistics that have nothing to do with the religion. Before I get to the religion, we need to tell the society why they need religion. Before I get to Allah and His Messenger says, we need to explain what Allah says, there's a wisdom to it. And if you open your eyes and you see the reality, you understand the wisdom of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. These types of filth and this genre, it directly corrupts the minds of young men. They have an unrealistic expectation of what it means to be a, a woman and how does one interact with a woman and how does one woo a woman and even how is one intimate with a lady even within marriage these types of men they cannot act normally and brothers and sisters I have to tell you wallahi it is sad and distressing I constantly get messages constantly from our own sisters begging me to give public talks about this. Do you really think that this filth is not prevalent amongst us? Do you really think that we are living in some bubble and we are not affected by this? Our own sisters have emailed me constantly. Every few days I get some similar type of email. She discovers her husband is addicted. Now she understands why her husband doesn't love her the way he's supposed to love her. And she feels, uh, literally, one sister said, I feel stabbed in my heart. I can't compete with this. I feel my self-worth is gone. I don't feel like a woman to him. I feel disgusted to be around him. Now I understand why he cannot, you know, be with me the way that a husband should be. This is the constant genre of emails I'm getting because, and by the way, of course, majority are our brothers, but no, no doubt, and it's a two-way street and sometimes uh, uh, the women are also, uh, you know, um, uh, addicted to this. But as we know, generally speaking, the addiction happens amongst the uh, male side. And our sisters and women, not just our Muslim women, women overall, all, they suffer from severe self-esteem issues. How can you compete with every supermodel out there? How can you possibly compete? Imagine if our sisters didn't have to compete. Imagine a society where all men and women dressed decently. Imagine that society where everybody dressed decently. In such a society, Every single average young man and average young woman, when they got to the age of marriage, they would appear super handsome and super beautiful to one another. In that society, when a woman and man are not competing with the latest supermodels, then marriage would be healthy, generally speaking. Sexuality within marriage would be healthy. Every husband would be attracted to his wife. Every wife would love her husband because there's no competition, no drama. But what's going to happen when you remove Allah's ahkam of the sharia? What's going to happen when the most beautiful top 0.01% of women are displayed everywhere with nothing left to the imagination? How can the 99.9% .9 of others compete? Not just that. Those 0.01%, they're not even real. They're fake images. They're photoshopped or they're, you know, generated with plastic and surgery. How do you expect the average lady whom Allah has blessed to be feminine how can she compete with the 0 0.0001 imaginary percent? That's why Allah Azza wa Jal shut this door. Shut this door completely because this genre corrupts the mind. This genre destroys the reality of manhood and of femininity. And subhanAllah, again, this needs to be said here that 
what, what worse methodology of corrupting our young men and women than by opening the door of capitalism and combining with immorality? When you have no haya, إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَصْنَعْ مَعْشِيْتَ As the Prophet said, when you have no haya, do as you please. What is going to happen when a struggling, vulnerable, 19, 20-year-old, 18-year-old, struggling to work a decent job, $10, $10, $10 an hour, and she is told, hey, I can give you, you know, a thousand dollars in a day by just doing something fahisha. I can sit in your, in your home and log on to your account and create, you know, some of these filthy websites and do it from your home and you can generate five, ten thousand dollars a month. What's going to happen to this young lady who wants to have a job? She's not old enough to understand the repercussions. She's just thinking, okay, five, ten thousand dollars is better than going and toiling in a factory or going to some, you know, uh, 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 you know some type of industry or whatnot. Let me just do this. And she doesn't understand the scars, the mental trauma that is going to happen. Billions of dollars are wasted in this filth and fahisha. And one of these yani, websites, I don't want to mention its name, it has over 200 million subscribers and it has opened the door for every single person, every young lady to be in her room and the entire world of filthy, creepy men are paying to see her. What an evil combination of capitalism and immorality and of course as we're all aware one third of the internet downloads are related to fahisha and pornography can you imagine one third of the internet and its downloads are related to this fahisha and ridiculousness and of course the stories go on and on and again and these are things that wallahi I, I, I hesitate to say but people need to hear and if it stops even any one of you from going here I've done my job I apologize for being being so explicit in this talk but you know what brothers especially brothers wallahi don't think that we are immune don't think that your own sons and, 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 and people are, don't know what's going on here. We are all affected by the fahisha around us. So if you feel uncomfortable, somebody has to lay the facts out for you. This whole industry is meant to corrupt the minds. It is meant to prey on vulnerable young women who don't know any better, who think that it's just a matter of a few weeks or months. You know, and I have to mention one particular famous story that was in the New York Times and all people are mentioning it. An Arab lady, an Arab young lady suffering from depression from family issues decided to enter this industry she was 19 years old she didn't have a job she didn't have money and she became the number one in this fahisha industry the number one this is a few years ago and she became one of the most viewed and whatnot she generated not millions hundreds of millions of dollars understand this hundreds of millions of dollars for that evil industry and then later she exposed the very industry she was a part of and now she has many articles she's launched a website and she said for all of that I've done I suffer from trauma I take you know antidepressants now I'm thinking of suicide my whole life is gone everywhere I go I feel disgusted and dirty and all that I got she said was $12,000 that's all they paid her. They got hundreds of millions. They got hundreds of millions off of her. And for her work, she just got some pennies. And now her whole life is gone. And now she says to young ladies out there, do not make my mistake. Don't go down this path. Understand, there are repercussions when you do this to yourself. See, this is what happens when you remove haya and you remove modesty and you remove hijab and you have a complete free-for-all. And brothers especially and also sisters, there's lots of good material out there that's clean. You can watch it and understand it. Many TED Talks about the dangers of pornography. Go on to YouTube and say TED Talk pornography. T-E-D, TED, you know, TED Talk. TED Talk pornography. You find multiple where people have discussed the academic side of the dangers of fahisha and there's many good documentaries as well on this issue and by the way before I get to now the Islamic side of things please anybody who's still thinking that men and women are the same biologically wallahi wake up and smell the coffee this industry shatters this ridiculous myth this industry of pornography and of escorts and of arrangements and of sugaring and of online and all of this only fans this industry completely demolishes this ridiculous myth that is being propagated by the politically woke leftist crowd of our times the man is not like the woman this industry it is predominantly catered by and to and from men and it is exploiting vulnerable women completely this is well known here Allah created the two of us differently we all have our weaknesses and when it comes to explicit images 
Clearly, the weakness is more in the one gender, and so the other gender is taken advantage of. The point is, brothers and sisters, before we get to what Allah Azza wa has told us, let us understand when Allah tells us to do something, it is for our own good. And we see what happens when we don't obey Allah and His Messenger. This is the reality of the world that we live in. Well, we as Muslims have to understand from reality and turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The damages of this, of this entire industry are long-term, not short-term. And shaitan himself wanted this to be his main tactic. In the story of Adam that I'm doing in my Wednesday halaqat, I have a whole lecture about the story of Adam and nudity. Because Allah says in the Quran, Ya Bani Adam, O children of Adam, لا يفتننكم الشيطان Make sure shaitan does not cause you to slip and fall. Like he caused your parents to be expelled from Jannah by exposing their nakedness. Notice, literally in the Quran, يَنزِعُنْهُمْ أَلِبَاسَهُمَا لِيُرِيهُمْ أَسُؤَاتِهِمَا he caused them to become naked and he caused their aura to become exposed and to be expelled from Jannah. Allah says, O children of Adam, do not fall for the traps of shaitan. This is explicit in the Quran. Allah is saying the primary mechanism to be expelled from Jannah and one of the main goals of shaitan because this opens the door to destroy a man's psyche, to destroy family, to destroy the building block of society. When fahisha becomes prevalent, when nudity becomes prevalent, it destroys the backbone of society. And that is why Allah says, لا يفتننكم الشيطان Don't let shaitan cause you to go astray by taking your clothes off. And Allah says in the Quran in the same surah, Ya Bani Adam, qad anzalna alaykum libasan. We have sent clothes down to you. Allah blessed us with clothes, like He blessed us with rain, like He blessed us with the Quran. Anzalna. Allah says, We sent down the rain. Allah says, We sent down the Quran. And Allah says, We sent down clothes. Even clothes is a divine gift from Allah to us. Now, all of this was a huge introduction so that we understand that there is a psychological and a, uh, uh, and a societal reason why Allah has ordained uh, men and women both to have their auras covered up. With that, let us now get to the, the meat of the matter, if you like, or the crux of today's talk. And that is, what is the requirement of a, a covering? And of course, because the talk is about women's hijab, we're gonna you know, talk about the women's gender obviously realize men also have an aura and men also have to cover and that's a more detailed talk but generally speaking between the navel and the knee and the aura uh, for the man is different but between the navel and the knee the requirements are the same must have loose cannot be tight cannot be see-through so the navel and the knee and also when the man is praying, then the chest must be covered as well. Just like uh, a woman has an extra aura when she is praying, so to the man when he is praying, then his upper body must also be covered. He cannot pray uh, with his upper body uncovered. So a man must have the navel to the knee covered at any time in public. And when he is praying, he must put a shirt on. Okay, women have a different aura. That's what we're going to talk about today. And our talk today will be about her aura in front of other men. As for the prayer aura, that's a fiqh class. Now I'm going to, because time is limited, I'm going to restrict myself to two verses in the Quran. And I want you to go back home and read these verses. These verses, they are all that you need for the hijab of a woman. They're all that you need. It's amazing that the Quran includes the major tenets of the hijab within it. The hadith just adds certain factors that are there, but you don't really need a hadith in this regard to understand the rulings of hijab. The hijab, the rulings of hijab, they came down in the fifth year of the hijrah. To be more precise, dhul qa'da of the fifth year of the hijrah. And it is interesting to note that the rulings of hijab were revealed as one of the final rulings of Islam. They were not the first. Way before this was the salah, the siyam, the, yeah, the, the fasting of Ramadan. You know, most of the hudud ordinances, they came down before this. So one of the final things revealed was that of the hijab. And that puts us into perspective that, yes, indeed, hijab is important. But you cannot equate hijab with salah or hijab with siyam. Hijab is a fard. But you, it's not to the same level of fard as any of the arkan of Islam. Nonetheless, it is a fard. And Allah revealed it in the fifth year of the hijrah in the month of Dhul Qa'dah. And there are two primary verses that uh, we need to study. Number one is Surah An-Nur, verse 31. And number two 
In Surah Al-Ahzab 59, memorize these verses. Nur 31 and Ahzab 59. And I want you to go and read these verses on your own, but I'm going to uh, explain them with some uh, level of tafsir. So Nur 31, 32, 33 onwards. Nur 31, Allah says, tell the believing men to lower their gaze and to be modest. That is better for them. Indeed, Allah is aware of what you do. So the verses of hijab begin with the men's gaze. So before we jump to what women should wear, men begin with ourselves. Tell the believing men to lower their gaze. Whenever you feel lust or whatnot, lower your gaze. That's where it begins. And to be modest. And that is better and purer for them. Indeed, Allah is aware of what they do. Now, and tell the believing women to lower their gaze. And to be modest. Then Allah, so exact same. Then Allah says, وَلَا يُبَدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا And let them not display their beauty. Let them not display their zina. Zina is anything that beautifies. Anything that, uh, jewelry is beautification. Your body is a type of zina. Allah is saying, let them not display. So there is an obligation for them to not display their beauty Except that which is apparent, that which they cannot control. So notice here, Allah is saying, they have a requirement, women have an extra requirement than men, because this, this phrase does not appear in the men's verse. And again, as I explained to you, look at the reality. Men and women have different fitnas. The fitna of women is different than the fitna of men. And indeed, Allah knows. So the fitna of men is the body of a woman. The fitna of men is the figure of a woman. As I said, forget all of this gender stuff, economics and advertisements and the TV and all that we have shows this reality. When you want to lure the man to buy something, what do you use? The body of a woman. And it's rarely vice versa. It's not the other way around. So the point being, Allah says, and let women not reveal their beauty except what is apparent. The meaning here, yubdin is a verb attributed to the women. And let women not make apparent that which is beautiful except what is beyond their control. Illa ma zahara minha. So what Allah is saying, what is beyond your control? Ibn Abbas said the silhouette of a woman. She can't control her silhouette. Some women are thin, some women are larger, some women are tall. This is ظَهَرَ minha. You can't control that. Allah is not going to call you to task for that. But what you can control, you must control. Then Allah explains, what does this mean? And this is the key phrase here. And in this phrase, most of the rulings of hijab are given. Allah says, وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُرِهِنَّ عَلَى جُيُوبِهِنَّ Four words. These four words summarize one of the main principles of hijab. وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُرِهِنَّ عَلَى جُيُوبِهِنَّ وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ is the command and they must. The wow and the lamb. The lamb is the must. And you must. This shows it is obligatory. And you must draw your khumur over your juyub. So daraba here means to draw shut. Daraba here means to bring together. Okay, because when you daraba, you bring two things together. So daraba to bring things together. And let them bring together their khumur over ala their juyub. So we have to explain what is khumur and what is juyub. And when we explain this, really it becomes crystal clear what the Quran is telling you. Let them draw their khumur. Khumur is the plural of khimar. And khimar comes from khamara. And khamara means to conceal or to cover. Khamara means to conceal or to cover. And that's why alcohol is called, what is alcohol called in Arabic? Khamr with a sukoon on the meme. Khamr, why? Because it conceals the mind. Your mind is lost when you become drunk. When you drink, 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 your mind is concealed. So it's called khamr. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded in the hadith in Bukhari, Umm Salama says that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded, Khammiru aniyatakum. Khammiru your aniyah, your, your covers before you go to sleep, your, your water bottles. 
Before you go to sleep, the Prophet said, cover your water bottles. Like, don't let some mice or some dirty things come in. Khammiru aniyatakum. There's an open bottle, open a canister of food. By the way, this is sunnah, by the way. It is sunnah. Uh, we should memorize the sunnah. If it's in the fridge, it's fine. But you just leave it outside. It's just sunnah to cover it up. Khammiru aniyatakum. This is a hadith in Bukhari. What does khammara here mean? What did I say khammara means to cover. Khammara, you cause it to be covered. So, khammiru aniyatakum. And in ancient Arabic, khimar was any covering for a man or a woman that covers the head. This is what khimar was, because it's covering the head. And we learned this, that even men's covering was called khimar. We have in the famous hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kana yamsahu ala al-khuffi wal khimari. He would wipe both over the socks and the khimar. What does it mean he would wipe over the khuf and the khimar? The khuf is what you put on your foot. And the khimar, would the Prophet wear khimar? Yes, he would in ancient Arabic. Because the khimar here means turban. The khimar means turban. So the Prophet kana yamsahu ala al-khuffi wal khimari. He would wipe over the sock and the khimar. You know the process of turban, you know, wrap it in turban. So it is permissible for the one who has a fully wrapped turban that he just wipes over it, just like it is permissible to wipe over the khuf. And the sahabi who's narrating, or Umm Salama who's narrating it, called the turban khimar. Because in ancient Arabic, any covering on the head was called khimar. Now, we call this covering hijab. That's fine. It's our terminology. Understand, when the Qur'an came down, the terminology that they used for this headscarf was khimar. It's simple as that. This is the key point. If you understand this, the whole Qur'an becomes clear. Let them draw the two sides of their khimar over their jayb, over their pockets, not to be pickpocketed, they put them all down over here. Jayb is pocket, we all know. Arabs, desis, we all know. Jayb means pocket. No, jabe doesn't originally mean pocket. Jabe means a slit. And the pocket is called jabe because you slit the garment and you have space there. So a jabe is this slit. This slit. Obviously the bosom area. This is the jabe. And the jahili ladies, just like the ladies in Europe of 17th century, just like the ladies here in America in the 19th century, they would cover their hair and they would throw their bonnets behind their backs. So the bosom area, the chest area, is exposed and protruding outward. And Allah is saying, because when the Qur'an came down, understand this point, every lady has her hair covered. It's the culture of the time. But their hair coverings were thrown behind them. So the bosom becomes exposed. Or, I mean, you know, covering there, but it's not... Uh, covered the appropriate manner so Allah says take your headscarf and instead of throwing it behind your back put it in front of you this is the meaning here so we learn from this not just that the headscarf is mentioned in the Quran but the headscarf should be loose and covering the upper section of a woman's body okay so the technically correct methodology is mentioned in the Qur'an. That the headscarf shouldn't just stop at the ears. It shouldn't just be a tightly wrapped thing here. No, there is a wisdom beyond the hair. And every man and woman understands this. There's a big difference between the, the headscarf covering the bosom versus the shirt or the blouse without the headscarf. There's a huge difference. And Allah is saying, let the headscarf come down. And let the headscarf act as a covering to the shirt that you are wearing. Because the Jahili ladies were wearing a skirt, obviously. It's not as if they're going without anything on top. They're wearing the shirt. They're wearing the skirt. But obviously, the skirt begins from the shoulder. And the shoulder will allow the chest area to protrude. So Allah is saying, have that extra covering. And put that khimar, which is what we call the hijab, put that khimar in front of you. So that your front area is also given that extra covering. This is what the Quran is saying. Then Allah repeats the first commandment. And let them not 
show their zina. Except for, then Allah lists the mahram here. Their husbands and their fathers and their sons and their uncles. So Allah lists all of the mahram here. Notice here, Allah says two times, What this demonstrates is that a woman has two levels of hijab. Two levels of awrah covering. One level in front of non-biological male, i.e. non-mahram. And that is, their headscarf has to cover their bosom. And the other level, in front of their fathers, that headscarf is no longer mentioned. So now Allah is saying, in front of your fathers, in front of your brothers, in front of your sons, you may now dress quote-unquote normally and don't show your beauty. And here our scholar said that her beauty, yani from her chest to her uh, uh, knee area, this is between her father and her brother and her uncle, you know, from her entire body, but her hair is not now here. Now it's not there. Her hand is not there. You know, the uh, lower part of her feet, you know, the, the underneath, the, the, that's not there. So here is a different type of ruling that Allah does not mention the headscarf. Allah does not mention illa ma zahara minha. Now it's not there. So in front of the father and the son and the brother, those rulings have been lifted. And she may dress what is considered to be appropriate, you know, a skirt, you know, a dress, a loose pant and shirt. All of this is permissible in front of her, in front of her biological male relatives, uh, meaning the mahram, you understand what I'm saying, the mahram, you okay? So this is the, the, the first verse, and that is Surah An-Nur, uh, verse 31 onward, 31, 32, 33. So look at those, those uh, verses over here. At the very end of this verse, by the way, Allah says, وَلَا يَضْرِبْنَ بِأَرْجُلِهِنَّ لِيُعْلَمَ مَا يُخْفِينَ مِنْ زِينَتِهِنَّ And this is a very key psychological understanding of the reality of hijab. And let them not stomp their feet so that their bracelets, their jewelry can be heard. Let them not stomp their feet. Let them not stomp their feet because when they stomp their feet, ankle bracelets were common back then. So when you stomp your feet, you're drawing attention to the jewelry. And what Allah is saying here. Allah didn't say stop walking in front of men. Notice. Allah did not say do not wear jewelry underneath your covering. Do not even wear ankle bracelets. No. But everyone knows when you want to draw extra attention, there are things you can do. When you want to draw extra attention, there are things you can do. Allah says don't go down that path. So if even the noise of jewelry if it is done innocuously, fine. But if you make a point, draw attention, Allah says, don't do it. Then what do you think of that which is more than just the noise of jewelry? You get my point here. You all understand my point. Because we all know as men, the noise of jewelry is nowhere near as a fitna or attractive than the actual physical beauty. But Allah demonstrates the smallest because in reality that's the smallest fitna the noise of jewelry right all men knows the smallest fitna but allah is saying to women even this do not go out of your way to draw attention to yourselves but he also didn't say don't wear jewelry he also didn't say take off your ankle bracelets no it is halal for her to wear ankle bracelets it is halal for her to dress the way that she does but anything that culturally is meant to be extra for the men of her time. Allah says, don't do that. Be decent and dignified and don't be flirtatious. This is very clear in this ayah. Now, this is Surah An-Nur 31 onwards. The next ayah we're going to do, Surah Al-Ahzab verse 59. Surah Al-Ahzab verse 59. And by the way, both of these surahs were revealed within two, three months of each other. So they're coming down pretty much at the same time. And Surah Al-Ahzab, it basically underscores the same concept, but it has a different word. Ya ayyuhan nabiyyu, O Prophet, قُلْ لِأَزْوَاجِكَ وَبَنَاتِكَ وَنِسَاءِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Tell your wives and your daughters, and because you are Rasulullah, tell all of the women of the believers. This ayah shows, and again, we will say this regardless of the consequences, we firmly believe, and this is our sharia, that each one of us is responsible for our families. And الرجال قوامون على النساء. We firmly believe this. 
And we have to answer to Allah for our families. And we have an extra responsibility for those whom Allah has put in charge, that, uh, put us over in charge of. It is a responsibility. We cannot يعني, physically you know, force an adult. We cannot physically force. But we are responsible. And we must always advise. And we must always understand. Allah will ask us, Ya ayyuhan nabiyu qul li azwajik. What is the purpose of Why didn't Allah say ya nisa an nabi? By the way, this surah is full of O oh, wives of the prophet, O oh, wives of the prophet, O oh, wives of the prophet. When it comes to this verse, notice Allah says, "O oh, prophet, tell your wives." Why? Because Allah is indicating that when it comes to this commandment in particular, we do have a bit of responsibility. We will be held accountable to whatever we are uh, 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 supposed to do according to our times and places. So every one of us, قُلِّ أَزْوَاجِكَ وَبَنَاتِكَ as well. We are responsible. Tell your wives and your daughters. And for the Prophet all believing women, and also for the khatibs and the people that are giving lectures like me, I'm telling all Muslim women, all Muslim women, what does Allah want us to tell them? يُدْنِينَ عَلَيْهِنَّ مِنْ جَلَابِيبِهِنَّ they should let down over themselves. Dana means to draw over, to come close, right? dan. So dana is to come close. The two gardens became close, Allah says in Surah Al-Rahman. So dana is to come close. Yudanina, they draw close over themselves. So let the believing women draw over themselves their jalabib, their jalabib. That is better for them. That is more appropriate for them. So that they shall be known and they shall not be harassed. They shall not be given irritation. Wallahu ghafur rahim, And Allah is forgiving and merciful. So Allah is commanding here our women to wear something called a jilbab. Now what is a jilbab? Jalabib is the plural of jilbab. Jilbab comes from the Arabic jalaba. And jalaba means to pull something from one place to another. And in the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah, uh, so the term jalaba means to pull something from another. So weapons are called يعني, uh, uh, julubban. They're also called julubban because the weapons that are covered up, when they're covered with that covering, they're called julub in the covering. So in the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah, one of the conditions that the Quraysh put upon the Muslims, they said, you may only enter Mecca with your weapons juluban, juluban. So your weapons have to be covered up. This is what uh, the Quraysh said upon them. So the meaning of jalaba, the meaning of jalaba is to pull from one place to another. And julub is that which is sheathed. So a jilbab is that which covers you. A jilbab is that which sheathes you. And therefore, a jilbab is definitely something that is mentioned in the Quran. So the Quran mentions two terms, khimar and jilbab. What is a khimar in our terminology? We call it a hijab. What we call a hijab, the Quran calls khimar. Okay? It's the face, the, sorry, the covering of the head. Now, a jilbab is also mentioned. And Allah says they should draw their jilbabs over themselves. What exactly is a jilbab? When you look, go and look at some of the classical lexicons, dictionaries of the Arabs. The most famous dictionary, by the way, is Lisan al-Arab of Ibn Mandur. He was a great scholar from Africa. And uh, Ibn Mandur compiled all of the dictionaries that were written before him, he compiled them in a massive collection called Lisan al-Arab. This is considered to be the primary encyclopedia of Arabic linguistics, the, the lexicon of Arabs. It was written in 700-something uh, Hijrah, a thousand, uh, I mean, 600, 700 years ago. In Lisan al-Arab, if you look up Jilbab, Ibn Mandur has a number of definitions. He says, Jilbab is a large shirt or a, a garment larger than a khimar, but smaller than a lower garment that a woman uses to cover her head and a chest. Or a sheet by which a woman covers her clothes from above. Or a jilbab is a khimar. So these are all definitions given in 
Lisan al Arab. If you want to look it up yourselves, it's volume 1, page 272 onwards. Now, what this verse indicates is that it is encouraged for a lady to have a covering over and above the clothes that she wears at home. And this is called what we call it a jilbab. We call it a jilbab. So it is definitely something that she should be encouraged to wear. Now, the issue comes, is the technical issue here. What is the minimal level of jilbab? And wallahi, it's sad we have to ask minimum. I understand. But at the same time, brothers and sisters, realize not everybody is the same level. So I will say this unabashedly. I will say this as explicitly as I can and ask Allah to protect me from all negative consequences and harms. There is no question that the Quran encourages khimar and jilbab. And therefore, there is no question that the ideal is that a lady has her headscarf and a lady also has a loose covering, a loose garment that she will cover herself with. And in our times, if you look at Muslim culture around the globe, it's very common for sisters to have some type of, you know, overcoat or call it what you will, right? And some type of headscarf, okay? There is no question that this is the default and the ideal. And it should be strive for. I have no problem, you know, with that. But obviously, let us be also explicit that not everybody is the same level. And some people need to start lower. Just like the Bedouin comes into the masjid and says, what's the bare minimum? Right? And the Sahaba are shocked. What do you mean the bare minimum? No, well, not everybody can pray to Hajjud. Not everybody can go the maximum. So we also need to know the bare minimum, even as we encourage the maximum. So please, yani understand this point that you cannot expect everybody. And brothers, it's not as if we're perfect. So yani understand, our sisters are at different levels. We're struggling with our issues. And yes, they have other issues to struggle with and we understand this so we do have to mention what is the minimum so there will be obviously a great spectrum of opinion here but uh, the position that um, uh, I'm advocating uh, which is aft after many years of research by the way also asking many ulama that I look up to and respect and trust but in the end of the day you have to either accept it or leave it it's up to you guys like Ibn Manzur said and it is in his dictionary the bare minimum of a jilbab is indeed a khimar. Hence, a large scarf will constitute both a jilbab and a khimar as long as the clothes underneath are filling the, fulfilling the requirements of the sharia. Ah. What are the requirements of the sharia? Ah? Cannot be tight, cannot be translucent, cannot be describing the contours of the body, and cannot be overly attracted. When Allah says, don't stomp your feet, you don't go above and beyond. It's got to be decent and dignified. Okay? So, and again, I know some people will not like this. This is my opinion. Realize that there's going to be multiple opinions out there. Allah knows best. The minimal level of required aura of a woman is that she covers her entire body with something that is loose and non-transparent, that is dignified and decent, and she covers her hair with a loose headscarf that covers the upper part of the body. If she does this, then she has done the Quranic minimum and she is not sinful. But the ideal which is higher than this is that she dress in something that is over her regular garment. And this is an extra jilbab layer. And she has the hijab as well. Okay? So there's no question that the Qur'an has two pieces here, the khimar and the jilbab. Now question, some people say Allah never commands women to wear the hijab in the Qur'an. And some people say the hijab was specific to the wives of the Prophet sallallahu And we say to this exactly what Ali radiallahu anhu said, when he heard the khawarij say, In al hukmu illa lillah, he said, Kalimatu haqqin urida biha batil. What they are saying is technically true, but what they want is false. So listen to me carefully. The hijab, as the Quran says it, is only for the wives of the Prophet. True. But the hijab as we use the word is not how the Qur'an uses it. 
Do you understand this point? What we say hijab, the Quran is saying khimar. So, what is hijab then? Hijab is mentioned in Surah Al-Ahzab. وَإِذَا سَأَلْتُمُوهُنَّ مَتَاعًا فَاسْأَلُوهُنَّ مِنْ وَرَاءِ حِجَاب When you ask the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for anything, then speak to them from behind a hijab. The hijab here is an actual physical curtain in the room. For the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they had a layer above what the rest of the women had. And that layer was their entire silhouette must be covered. You cannot, as a man, Ajnabi, see the silhouette of the body of the women of the Prophet ﷺ. So how do you get it by then? If you have to go to the house of Aisha to learn ilm, there will be a curtain. We learned this from Sahih Bukhari. It's well known. Every book of Hadith mentions it. The, the, Aisha would teach. Sauda would teach. Uh, Umm Salama would teach. The men would be uh, in front. Not, but not in front physically. There would be an actual curtain. She would be behind the curtain. They would be, be from one side of the curtain. That curtain the Quran calls, what is it called? Hijab. That curtain is not obligatory on anyone other than the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. So when these people come along and say, oh, the Quran says that hijab is only for the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, we say, kalimatu haqqin urida biha batil. What you have said is technically true, but what you intend is completely false. Because when they say the hijab, they mean the khimar, the head's covering. And they're saying, oh, the head covering was only for the wives of the Prophet. No, 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 no. Not at all. I just quoted you the verses. So we say the Quran is very clear that the head must be covered, the upper chest must be covered, and there must be loose requirements in this regard. Now before we uh, conclude, is there any difference of opinion about uh, what I have said? Uh, so there is no difference of opinion in all of the schools of Islamic law. When I say all, I mean all. All of the Sunni schools and the schools beyond Sunni. The Shia schools, the Ibadi schools, the Zaydi schools, the Mu'tazidi schools. There is no difference of opinion in all of the schools of Islam that a woman her entire body should be covered in loose clothing that is not transparent and that her hair should be covered. There is ijma' beyond Sunni Islam in this point. The only difference comes over what is the bare minimal types of covering. That's, we talked about that, okay. And the face covering, which I'm not going to get into today. This, yes, I will be honest with you, you will find lots of heated debate. But there is no ikhtilaf in the history of Islam, that a woman's body must be covered with a loose covering overall, and her hair must be covered. Just her hands and her face, this is the area of dispute, and then the minor details of, you know, the type of, yani, uh, uh, you know, the details of the hijab. Yes, like I explained, what is the minimum and what not. But the, the fact that her body must be covered, Al-Qurtubi, Al-Nawawi, Ibn Abd al-Barr, um, who else? Uh, I have a whole list over here. They all mention there is ijma of the ummah, that a woman's body must be covered in totality, other than her face and her hands, uh, so in reality, there is no ikhtilaf whatsoever in this regard. Before I conclude, I wanted to just point out, I was bombarded with emails from India asking me to explain whether the hijab is, is obligatory or not because of the Supreme Court issue. And I want to say here, I don't agree with this notion of the Supreme Court deciding uh, whether it is a part of our religion or not. The Supreme Court of India or of Karnataka is not in a position to decide what is and isn't Islamic. It's not their domain, and it doesn't matter to me what they decide. It's like you're asking me, what does the Indian constitution say? It's not my area. So the Supreme Court of India or of that state has no business getting involved in what is and isn't a requirement of Islam. They need to ask the experts of the Sharia, they need to ask the scholars of Islamic law, and they will not find a single differing opinion amongst the reputable scholars of Islam that a woman's body in its entirety should be covered. The only ikhtilat they'll find, as I said, is the face and the minor details. But in terms of the headscarf, it is a part of our uh, Islamic identity. So I wanted to mention that point here. And also, before I conclude as well, Obviously, dear sisters, uh, obviously, 
and brothers as well, understand that this obligation, while it is indeed an obligation, it is nowhere near as obligatory as the arkan of Islam. And I understand sometimes, and I'm going to say this bluntly, that some of our sisters who are struggling with this, they feel uncomfortable by the level of emphasis that is given to this obligation vis-a-vis -vis other obligations. And I understand this point. In the end of the day, we're all struggling with our sins. And it's very easy for us men who don't have to worry about the pressure that comes to keep on bringing up this issue and making a point of it. So what I say then is that those who are involved, so those who are responsible for their family members, husbands, fathers, yes, it is your obligation to raise the bar, to teach and preach, and to gently yani, bring about this within your household, yes. But those that are not a part of your family, it's not your business to go and talk to other women, strange women. I mean, what are you doing commenting on other women's clothing? It's not your business. And this has got me into trouble, believe it or not. It's got me into a lot of trouble. Especially our younger brothers, they get irritated. Yeah, akhi, why are you looking at other women anyway and commenting on what they're wearing? Don't. Just don't. Leave it to the preachers and teachers. I did say this explicitly. I will continue to preach. Didn't I just preach now what the hijab is? Leave it to the preachers and scholars to speak to the whole community. And then leave it to the fathers and the husbands and brothers to deal with their own families. But I will say this, that the individual brother, young man walking on campus, do not just comment on another lady's dress and, oh, I know you, I know your father. Yeah, you're going to make things worse. And by unanimous consensus, if you preaching the truth is going to bring more harm, then don't preach the truth for that particular point over there, okay? And we know the reality that our sisters are already struggling and whatnot, and some random man commenting on their body and what they wear is only going to make it worse. So I will not back down. I said this before, I'll say it again. Let the preachers and the khatibs preach to the whole community, and then let fathers and brothers and whatnot be involved with their immediate relatives. I say this bluntly. Do not get involved with women that you're not related to. Don't comment. It's not your business. You're only going to make things worse. Now to our sisters, I also want to say that, yes, I understand it's a sensitive topic, and I know we're all struggling, and I know that there are many sins, and no doubt the sin of backbiting is very bad, and the sin. so we have to mention all of these things. And I understand that prayer is much more important. And inshallah, if a lady is praying her prayers and fasting in Ramadan and giving zakah, you know, we hope the best for her. We hope that Allah forgives all of her sins. But in the end of the day, after all is said and done with all the caveats, is it obligatory for a woman to cover her entire body? Yes, it is. I have to say this as well. I can't change this reality. Is it as important as salah? No, but okay. But let's, let's talk about all of that as well. But you cannot expect us to ignore this reality is what I'm saying. I understand some of you feel that we men bringing up a lot of times. I understand this. So let's not counter that reality with the opposite. And that is to ignore this topic. Let us bring it up as gently as possible. Let us encourage our sisters as gently as possible. Let us tell them we understand as much as we can as men, it is a struggle. We understand we have our problems and issues and you have yours and we're here to support you. And obviously, dear sisters, it goes without saying, in lands and in situations where you feel your life is threatened, where you feel a mob will come and harass you, there is no question that in those circumstances it is halal to take it off. There's no question. I mean, this is it's a no-brainer. You don't need to be a, a scholar even to understand this. If you can eat a pig when you're about to die, then for sure you can take a headscarf off when men are going to physically intimidate and, and punch and hit you. There's no question about that. And there are times and places and locations around the globe where in Indeed, your life is under threat when that is happening. So the general rule, when the situation becomes difficult, the sharia ah becomes easy. Memorize this. When the situation becomes difficult, the sharia ah becomes easy. Having said that, there's no doubt as well that every community should come together and help its sisters. And when the situation is that bad in a particular locality, then rather than just tell the sisters to take the hijab off, we should tell the brothers to become men. Stand up and do what you need to do as well. So again, I'm speaking generically that, yes, when the situation becomes tough, 
May Allah make it easy and perhaps you have some congestion sisters, but we brothers also have to do something. And I hope inshallah it never gets to that stage in the land that we live in. As for the lands that where this is happening, we make dua for them. We know the situation is getting very tense over there. We know that, you know, they're trying to do what they can. And we make dua for them. And Allah Azza wa Jal will be their hasib. And Allah Azza wa Jal will be their mawla. And with that, inshallah ta'ala, I conclude for uh, today. We ask Allah to protect and guide all of our brothers and sisters to the best of akhlaq and manners. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to grant us chastity and haya. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal, ya sitir, to cover our awrat in this dunya and the akhirah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not allow us to call fall prey to the traps of shaitan and to live dignified and righteous lies full of haya and iman and taqwa which zakumullahu khayran wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh fa ya dhulli wa ya khajali idha ma qala li rabbi amastahiyayta ta'asini wa la takhsha min al-atabi وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى رضا